the Athletic, the Off the Hook podcast at offthehook.com or Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or wherever you go. Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and iHeart. Like, share, follow, subscribe. Off the Hook, Dave Hooker, start. And here we are with this guy. It is the one, the only Josh Ward who joins us weekly, brought to you by Azul Beer Company. I'll tell you more about that fantastic location and the products that they have. But first, let me remind you, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, and we can bring you more content. And everybody loves more content from the one, the only Josh Ward. His appearance brought to you today by Azul Beer Company. They've won awards that are worldwide. They have a great location in downtown Knoxville with a panoramic view of the city. I don't know why you wouldn't go to Zool Beer. Go to ZulBeer.com. Josh, how are you, sir? Dave, I'm doing well. We're getting closer, under four weeks to go until the season kicks off. We are. We're It's it's right around the corner. Somebody told me 28 days on Thursday. I don't know. when. Whenever you may be watching this, we taped it on Thursday. And somebody told me 28 days. I was like, no, that's not right. And I, I hearken back, Josh, how many times did it was the icebreaker with a coach? So I don't know if you use this. I use this all the time. Well, I stopped. And I would say, so you ready for the season to get started? And they'd say, bleep, no, I could use another two weeks or a month. They're I know the ready. feeling. Josh, I know the feeling now. Yeah, they're never ready. Well, uh, from the coach's standpoint, last year was a rebuilding year for Nick Saban at Alabama. So that gives oh. you the mindset. Uh, of how coaches react. If, if Nick Saban feels that way, imagine how coaches feel where they have work to do to climb to that point. So, yeah, from the media standpoint, you know, May, June, and July, they've actually become busier months. We get to August, and man, it, it's kind of a, a flood of content and everything to put out, but that's great. I'm, uh, I'm very excited for games to get here less than four weeks until we see real college football games, and because Tennessee's starting a little bit earlier than most, they'll kick off before the rest of college football. And we have the Hall of Fame game this weekend. Will you be laying a wager on that game? Because if so, I'm driving to your house and I'm taking you to therapy. Well, Dave, yeah, that that's a Thursday night game. So uh, Raiders oh, minus they, two and a half. Yeah, that's, that's a Thursday. So that's some uh, – we're, we're having this conversation right before kickoff. So if you want to <laughs> pause to take the lock of the year, my first lock of the year, Raiders minus two and a half. I mean okay. – yeah, hopefully everybody yeah. that sees this is after kickoff so that you don't go do minus two and a half or take the over under is 30 and a half. So we, we know both numbers. Well, it, it will be. <laughs> they will this, see it it's, the a, it's a Raiders game, Dave. So the, the best, the best I kicking off before everybody else. I have to be honest with you. I'm learning backup offensive guards. So at this point, I didn't know it was a Thursday game. Well, you should. So they would, nobody should. Yeah. Nobody should. And they shouldn't be gambling on it. But so when you see this, I hope that Josh Ward has celebrated a Raiders victory because I appreciate Josh because Josh is like me. He was born and raised in Knoxville. So we're going to get to Tennessee, I promise. But you basically had, what, four teams to root for because there weren't any Titans. And you're younger than me. Maybe there were some in your adolescence. But there weren't any Titans. You got the Falcons. You got a lot of um, uh, some Panthers. It was awful. But w- the four teams you always got when I was – young and learning about football it was the Raiders it was the Dolphins it was the Cowboys and then I'm trying to think what the the other team was but it seems like maybe the Steelers Steelers are oh, very, they Ste- are very everywhere yeah. they're, they're everywhere yeah yeah it was the Steelers and then for a brief period when Heath Schuler went to the Redskins we saw a lot of a lot of Redskins that lasted about a year um but uh Josh, let's, let's turn it to the balls. Josh was uh, uh, just fantastic in heading up our top incoming freshman as we had that list, and it culminated with uh, number one. And I think it would have been very easy to go a junior college route, especially since Tennessee – or a transfer route since Tennessee has guys coming in with college experience – but Josh, talk about your number one selection and why you went in that direction. I uh, didn't mean to rhyme there. Running back Justin Williams Thomas. Uh, he was my choice because I think he's going to make an impact on this offense. Dave, if you talk to Justin Williams Thomas, you will walk away impressed. He does not sound like a true freshman. I don't even know that he feels like a true freshman because he came in in January and was able to go through spring practice. And that 
really does matter in trying to get ready. And I, I promise it's going to matter to Tennessee's coaches because if he's out there on the field, he has to be trusted not just to run the football. I think that's probably going to be pretty comfortable for him. But to protect Hendon Hooker, who the season is going to rely on most likely, that's going to matter. And can he catch balls out of the backfield? Because that's going to be part of his role. He said he worked on that during the summer months. So it's going to be Jabari Small to start out, and it should be. I think he could have a really big season if he stays healthy. But, Dave, we've already seen Jalen Wright be slow to start camp. We've already seen Lyneth Whitehead go out for the season. Uh, Lynn J. Dixon has come in, but he's still going through the acclimation period. He's new to the team, and I think expectations maybe on the outside have already gotten a little out of control with Lynn J. Uh, maybe. I think Justin Williams, yeah, I think Justin Williams, uh, Justin Williams Thomas can be a really good player for Tennessee. He's bigger than some of the other backs in the backfield, and he said he's going to play about 215. So I like James Pierce a lot. The transfers you mentioned, I think Wesley Walker and Andre Turrentine will make an immediate impact, but I like Williams Thomas' role, and I like his ability. Yeah, and I want to encourage people to be sure and check out that um, that string of articles and the series that we had on the top incoming players because they're, it was kind of tough, Josh, once you got towards the top five-ish. I mean, I feel like there are a minimum of five guys that will contribute at a fairly high level in year number one. Well, they're they're in year number one at Tennessee. Yeah, they're going to have a chance to. And, you know, part of this is thinking immediate impact, short term, and also what they can grow into. And the conversation in August and September could be different in October and November. I'll give you an example. One of our top five guys, Addison Nichols, he was here in the spring. He worked at center. Right now, I don't think Tennessee's coaching staff would be really comfortable with him if they needed him at center. A true freshman handing the football off to their all SEC quarterback candidate, I think that would create some concern. But as he gets more reps in August and at the start of the season, if something happens in the middle of the year, they might be able to count on him. He's a guy that could play a number of positions. He was the highest rated signee in the class. So there, there was already some <laughs> accolades next to Addison Nichols' name. But right now, I don't think he would rank as high in terms of guys that can get on the field. Those, those edge rushers look impressive physically out there in the field. Are they ready for the physicality of the SEC? These are still questions that have to be answered. And then, you know, the, the transfers, again, Brew McCoy, assuming he's cleared and, and eligible, they brought him in to make an impact right away. The same would be said for the secondary members. And then Gerald Nincy could help at tackle, uh, but you know, he's battling for that starting position against last year's JUCO transfer in J.J. Crawford. But you're starting to see this roster not turned over, but you are starting to see it filled out, and it will turn over over the next year. Uh, Lynn J. Dixon is the the person that you were the running back that you were talking about transferred from West Virginia to Tennessee. This struck me as a little odd for a couple of different reasons. One, he was in the doghouse at Clemson. That's acknowledge. He goes to West Virginia for just a semester. Is this a guy that I understand the lack of depth at running back, especially with the preseason injury, but is this a guy that Tennessee really wants to take a chance on as good as chemistry is? I, you know, He's got to learn pass protection first or he's not going to get on the field. You, know, you could be looking at him not having an impact till October. What did you make of them even taking him? They don't have many players at the position. They have four. Yeah. Two of them are freshmen. And one of them's unavailable right now in Jalen Wright. So you know, think about, it, Dave, if Jabari Small went down in practice tomorrow and you didn't have Lynn J. Dixon – you have two running backs, and they're both freshmen. That's not going to cut it. So, uh, so Lynn J. Dixon has ability. He has experience, which should allow him to come in and I, I think pick things up more quickly. Let's see physically if he's truly ready to go, but we know he has the athletic ability at the position. And is there some risk uh, with you know, chemistry and all that? I think potentially, but that's why you rely on Hendon Hooker who was established at quarterback, Cedric Tillman, who is an established leader at receiver, Jerome Carvin, who's a really important player on this team at guard. If if there's something going wrong, these guys would have any issue letting that be known. You know, Cooper Mays is a year older. Jacob Warren and Princeton Fant, those guys have played a lot now at tight end and are other players. So if Lynn J. Dixon does not live up to what is expected of him by the coaches and, I would say, the players now, then I don't think he'll be at Tennessee. So I, I look at it as little, re little risk, 
potential reward that's obvious in the offense and again the need but Dave there Dixon was so um for him I hope he recognizes and one more shot in a really good this is a great opportunity for Lynn J Dixon yeah I mean he uh, let's look at it on the optimistic side he could come in with the right attitude have a great second half of the year again I don't think he's going to be a factor in September because of the pass protection um, or lack thereof, that, that he may be able to put on the field. But he could have a good second half of the year. And we've seen guys, I'm not comparing him to, but we've seen guys like Alvin Kamara. We've, we've seen him take off in the NFL um, at college production. So, I mean, I guess it could work out for him. I, it was just a head-scratcher um, to – to bring him in and expect him to be ready anytime soon, I thought. Well, if Lyneth Whitehead's available for the season, I don't know that they are, but right. he's not. So uh, I just I, the the biggest thing to me is the I, you know, it, I like Justin Williams Thomas. He hasn't proven me right yet, though, and I sure. like Dylan Sampson. He hasn't proven me right that he's going to be a good player, and he's not a a big back. So um, Jabari dealt with injury issues last year. Jalen Wright's dealt with injury issues since he's been at Tennessee. So they just, to me, it's, it's a scholarship number issue. Uh, four running backs have in the SEC could be scary for Tennessee's coaches. And he does have a lot to learn, but so do Williams Thomas and, and Sampson without the college experience and without the confidence of, okay, this is what you do in a big time game. Lynn J. Dixon wasn't just playing somewhere else in college, he was playing in a program that had the highest expectations on the field. So that's not going to affect him and picking up or see what you see from a college defense. He's done that. Two of the running backs have not. So I don't know what to expect. I, I did mention earlier though, I think expectations have already gotten out of control. I think fans have already said have already some, not all some fans have already said, okay, so you think he just takes over and starts ahead of Jabari small? No, no. <laughs> uh, no. At some point, I mean, maybe, but, you know, but I think this is a guy with talent and with obvious upside on the field to come in and fill a spot that is pretty wide open behind Jabari Small. Yeah, I mean, I like Jabari Small, you? Yeah, I like him too. I mean, I, I'm not going to say he's going to do what Travis Stevens did in, in 2001 and bust out to that level, but think about he played last season essentially the entire season injured. He hurt his shoulder in that Pittsburgh game, and he plays running back, Dave. That's not a good spot to be hurt. So he powered through as best he could. He's shown running ability. I, I like him. I think he's a really good running back for Tennessee in this offense. I think it can fit him really well. Great reference to Travis Stevens. That week, uh, two things that I've never seen before or after happened, and that was uh, Travis got called in 2001, let's see what you do against Florida by a media member, and said media member after he ran for over 220 yards with another media member because they joked about it. So that's a great reference that brings back a lot of memories, times from the press box. But, Josh, let's turn to quarterback for a second. Okay, so I want everybody to work out for Joe Milton. He seems like a great person. But talking to somebody close to the program, I, th I think they want to make sure that they have Tavon Jackson ready. Um, the step out of bounds against Ole Miss in the heat of battle to me, might be one of those mistakes that are impossible to overlook. And he has accuracy issues. So let me ask you a, a two-pronged question. If Hendon Hooker decided <clears throat> that he had something, excuse me, <clears throat> more important to do in the opener and they had to play second-string guy, who is it? And then in, as of October the 15th, midway through the season, Jackson having that time, who would it be? Well, um, opener, Hendon Hooker's not available. I think it's Joe Milton. If Joe Milton continues to struggle and shows the same issues as last year, then I would be very curious what the coaches think about Taven Jackson's uh, progression because you can't continue to have that. But again, numbers-wise, you're limited to that conversation. So Joe Milton's important for Tennessee. They do not want Hendon Hooker to go down, but he did last year, and one of the big on the team right now would be left tackle where you're your JJ Crawford or Mincy getting beaten on the edge and a hit being delivered to Hinton Hooker 
to this conversation becoming very real. So the, a lot of the conversation has been really positive about Joe Milton continuing to buy in and wanting to prove that he can play the quarterback position and being a good teammate. And he and Hendon Hooker have a really good relationship, and that is a positive sign. In fact, I feel like Tennessee is, is a positive sign because we've seen guys – just up and go if things don't go well. So uh, if if something were to happen to Hendon Hooker in the start of September, then Joe Milton gets another chance to prove he can play quarterback in the SEC. M- middle of October, I don't know. Dave, remember C.J. Leak? He was the backup to Casey oh, Lawson, yeah. and he was given a chance to be the guy as the backup, and it just didn't go well. Now, I, I think there's more upside with Milton in terms of playing ability in this offense, but – if you continue to find issues and you feel like, okay, we're not getting it fixed. Remember they went to James Banks and said, we'll just see what we can figure out with this talented freshman. That's a potential situation. If you have to go to the number two, who is Joe Milton and the number two cannot deliver. Yeah. I mean, maybe you could throw a squirrel back there, but I don't think there were a couple of plays. I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. 170 pounder. That's running at an SEC defense. Be careful. How many times you do that? <laughs> You think that guy's 170 pounds, and you think I'm 170 pounds? So I, I, um, hey, I'm I'm five eleven in the program, Dave. So don't question my numbers. That's right. I've got you a six foot. Okay. So um, six even point oh two. Uh, yeah, I. It's funny you bring up CJ League. I don't know if you did that on purpose, but they both have the herky jerky release, like a boxy sort of release that. To me, it's like a free throw shooter. We don't talk big Ben Simmons or any of the guys that just can't shoot. You got to tear that down and start it anew. I don't even know that that can happen in a year. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, if there's a coaching staff that deserves the benefit of the doubt, it's this one, right? Because essentially sure. everybody else has worked out. But that's that's why a year ago there was the hype around Milton because his physical attributes were obvious. But he had transferred from Michigan, and for some reason, people thought Jim Harbaugh couldn't coach football. So uh, that was the reason that it didn't work for Joe. And it's like, hey, well, actually, Jim's still a pretty good coach, and Josh Heupel and his coaches, we know, can do a good job. And it it didn't work for Joe. And he didn't have a ton of time last year. He had more time. And I and I meant it when I said he deserves credit for continuing to buy in and being a good teammate. And and uh, he and Hendon Hooker have a a really good relationship. That's important. Because if they do have to count on Joe again, teammates are going to know that. And I think that they'll have his back. But if that's the case, he's still going to have to go perform. And, and I, you know, I don't know. I mean, C.J. Lee knew plenty about football. He, he w- went on after his playing days and went into scouting and working for the NFL. He understands the game. And, I, you know, Joe very talked smart. to him. He, Joe's very intelligent. He, he understands. It's just it hasn't translated to the field yet but he's adamant i'm a quarterback and that's that's my future and there's a real chance that he gets a chance to show that again at tennessee that's why he needs to be ready nobody wants that to happen everybody wants hendon to stay healthy and have a a big season but if if not then joe milton gets a chance to show again it it was brought up uh paraphrasing the question but about losing his job or being beaten out and he said he didn't lose his job and he did but, you know, in his mind, he got hurt, and then they went to Hendon, and it worked out, and they they stuck there. So Joe has kept the mindset of, I'm going to have success at a quarterback, and I really do think that matters, but uh, you have to do more than that to win in the SEC. I appreciate it. I root for the young man as I root, for, you know, for the guys I hear about, and I don't know him personally, but the guys I kind of get to know. But I just – I think there's some real mechanical issues that I don't know that, that can be fixed, like I said. Um, and I do remember very well that uh, the CJ Leak game where he didn't play and uh, who was in the stands, Chris Leak, who was going to come to Tennessee and decided not to because he was sitting in the stands at Georgia Stadium while James Banks was running around and almost pulled the upset. What would have happened had CJ Leak been the guy that almost pulled the upset, had continued to start the rest of the season and until – um, until he was no longer needed because of health. And Josh, that was that was a really pivotal moment in Tennessee football history. Things would have been much, much different. I don't know how better or worse, but they would have been different. I don't know either. And in, in terms of results, I'm not sure. But I mean, four years later, CJ Leak's helping lead Florida to a national championship and Tennessee's facing him obviously in the East instead of having him be the quarterback. And 
Yeah, assuming if if everything worked out for CJ the rest of his time at Tennessee, I think Chris comes to Tennessee. I think he sticks with that plan. So he's probably the guy. I don't think you have a class of Eric Ainge and Brent Schaefer. So uh, maybe you don't have the 2005 disaster of a season, right? So then uh, your your trajectory is different. A, a lot could change. But there are a number of butterfly effect questions with Tennessee. I think that 07 SEC title game is definitely one. But CJ Leak, if you know if Casey doesn't get hurt and you don't need CJ, just continues to be the trusted backup. You know that that you know, that was pivotal moment in that decade for Tennessee there's no way to know what happens next but I don't I don't think you have the rough waters that Tennessee how about another um a guy named Chris Sims was committed to Tennessee I can remember staying at a radio station late at night because he was going to make his announcement and then the next thing you hear from him he's not coming to Tennessee and the next time you hear from him he said Tennessee's players are all racially divided which was an interesting shot out the door but um, Josh, you're right. I mean, that was one of those pivotal moments that we don't know what would have happened. Yeah. Um, maybe Casey still comes. I don't know. He came in a class with Rete and beat him out pretty quickly. Right. So maybe Casey still does. I'm not sure, but, uh, that would have been an interesting battle, right? Because then, then you're talking about, uh, I, yeah, I don't know who stays there, but you have, you have Matthews, Sims, um, Suggs and Clawson. It was already interesting. So throw Sims in there, then yeah, it really gets that way. So, I don't know, but uh, that's that's a big one for sure. That, there could have been a recruiting impact even more so with yeah. Sims coming to Tennessee instead of Texas. So there's there's that there's always the recruiting aftermath. Like if if Tennessee goes to the Rose Bowl in 01 instead of losing to LSU, you have another SEC title, but you have that national stage. Even if you don't beat Miami, I think Miami wins. But Tennessee would have had Albert Hainsworth, John Henderson, and and Will Overstreet. They're not getting pushed around. I, I promise that. But it, no matter the result of the national championship game, another SEC title and the Rose Bowl that have helped recruiting. So, uh, Dave, I don't think there's any program in the country, and I mean this, that has more what ifs than Tennessee football. And I'm just talking over the last 25 years. Yeah. You want to go back to 2001? That was my fault because I booked my flight, I booked my hotel, I booked everything at halftime of the SEC championship game to go to LA and cover the Rose Bowl. And Tennessee couldn't stop a draw. So, anyway, for Josh Ward, I'm Dave Hooker. You can check Josh out. End on that note. There you go. Yeah. I was going to be Grab in LA. Grab beer now. You'll, you'll probably <laughs> yeah, even after, after how we closed out today's segment. I had found full-service Marriott in Manhattan Beach. I mean, I was golden. Booked early enough where it was fairly affordable. Not that I was really worried about that. I feel you like can the, hear... the roses at Tom Black Track also probably weren't a, a good idea. Oh, that, my... that wasn't on you. So. Gosh. <laughs> forgot about that one yeah. waiting there at midnight or what 2 a.m is mike hammond and a big bunch of roses hmm. i'll leave you with that he's just short of thorns <laughs> dave hooker sorry i uh, listen to him on the sports animal from noon to three and uh he might write a, th- uh, a thing or two for us on offthehooksports.com. I want to thank Zool Beer. Zool Beer with the panoramic view of downtown. Great place to hang out. We're going to start to do some events there. Looking forward to that with some former balls. And also, they win worldwide awards for their hazy IPA. It's just that good. Josh has had a sip on the lake. He sent me a picture. So they're definitely a thumbs up. Zoolbeer.com. Check them out downtown Knoxville. This is a presentation of Off the Hook Sports. <laughs>